Bona tarda. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Parlem en català perquè hi ha traducció simultània. En primer lloc, en nom de l'equip de govern de l'Autònoma, benvinguts en aquest congrés, que ja té una tradició de realitzar-se en aquesta facultat. Procedirem a un breu torn d'intervencions perquè el més important no és els que estem aquí, sinó el que es farà després durant el Congrés. Deixeu-me començar a presentar-me. Jo soc Armand Sánchez, vicerector de Recerca i Transferència de la Universitat Autònoma de Barcelona i tinc el plaer d'estar aquí avui amb vosaltres per la inauguració d'aquest Congrés. Començarem donant la paraula a la doctora Amparo Hurtado, investigadora principal del pacte i grup que és el que està al darrere de l'organització d'aquest congrés en aquesta edició i li cedeixo la paraula perquè us doni la benvinguda. Bona vesprada. Bona vesprada a tots. En nom del Grup Pacte vull donar-vos la benvinguda a aquesta quarta edició de DITRAD. Quan preparem el Congrés sempre pensem que no serem tants com en les edicions precedents, però resulta que és a l'inrevés. Cada cop rebem més resums i cada cop hi ha més ponències i aquesta és l'edició més voluminosa. Vàrem rebre quasi 200 resums i finalment hi ha 17 comunicacions, 3 taules redones i 9 pòsters. I a més a més en moltes llengües, castellà, anglès, portugués, francès i alemany. I som quasi 200 congressistes. Un cop més haveu vingut de molts països, en concret de 32 països diferents i de tots els continents. És, doncs, un congrés multilingüe i divers. I això forma part de les senyals d'identitat de la nostra disciplina, perquè la traducció i la interpretació són precisament la garantia del multilingüisme i de la diversitat. En aquesta edició hi ha algunes novetats. Per la primera novetat he de demanar disculpes. En guany, excepcionalment, no hem organitzat el seminari d'especialització en didàctica de la traducció, que, com sabeu, està adreçat a la formació de formadors. És un curs especialment carregat de feina per al grup Acte i, malauradament, no ho podíem assumir. Per la segona novetat, tal vegada hauria de demanar disculpes, també. I en aquest cas, per no haver-ho fet abans. Hem introduït en el Congrés un àmbit nou, la traducció i la interpretació de llengua de signes, i aprofite per donar les gràcies als nostres intèrprets, Júlia Toses, cap a la llengua de signes catalana, i Carlos Rodríguez, cap a la llengua de signes brasilenya. Una altra novetat és que divendres a l'acte de clausura hi haurà un sorteig. En aquest punt no demanaré disculpes, però sí que vull fer un aclariment. Ens ho hem copiat. Ja sé que no és una actitud molt pedagògica, però hem copiat la idea dels companys hispanoamericans que ho fan en els seus congressos de traducció. Farem, doncs, un sorteig de llibres. Ho teniu explicat al quadern del Congrés i també teniu l'explicació a la sala on hi ha l'exposició de venda de llibres i ahí podeu trobar també els llibres que seran sortejats. Pensem que és una bona manera de dir-vos adeu i que us porteu un record nostre. I darrera novetat hem ampliat un dia més el Congrés. Per això comencem avui. Voldria donar algunes indicacions per al Congrés. En primer lloc, a la bossa teniu diverses informacions. Per a aquells que ho haveu demanat, teniu el llibret imprès del Congrés amb el programa, el resum, 
els participants, indicacions de la facultat, etc. I els que ho heu preferit només teniu el programa imprès. També teniu informació sobre accés a internet, informació sobre restaurants que estan a prop de la facultat i teniu una fitxa de votació per al millor pòster del Congrés. El premi és un certificat, el millor pòster, està patrocinat per la revista Languages i aquest premi es donarà també divendres a l'acte de clausura. Podeu visitar i votar els pòsters a l'aula 1. Una altra indicació és que tots els que portem un indicador taronja formem part de l'equip d'organització i de direcció i estem a la vostra disposició. Qualsevol canvi a aquests tres dies de congrés estarà sempre anunciat al programa que està penjat a l'entrada, on està al costat de de recepció i també a la porta de les aules respectives. Us anuncio ja tres anul·lacions que hem tingut malauradament en el darrer minut. En la sessió 1 està anul·lada la participació d'Angelone. En la sessió 2 la comunicació de Carré i en la sessió 11, més difícil de pronunciar per mi, la comunicació de TeachGAT. He d'anunciar-vos també que els que estan a la sala 5 podran fer preguntes en la conferència plenària que començarà tot seguit. Una altra indicació, encara que està a la pàgina web i s'ha anunciat, és que els certificats s'enviaran per correu electrònic la setmana propera i també amb el mateix missatge us enviarem un enllaç a una enquesta de valoració del Congrés. Us animem a omplir aquesta enquesta. I darrera indicació, i amb això acabaria amb les indicacions, com les edicions precedents no fem publicació d'actes, no tenim la infraestructura per fer-ho. Ara bé, com també vàrem dir en les altres edicions de DITRAD, us encoratgem a presentar iniciatives de publicacions i adquirim el compromís de recolzar i difondre qualsevol iniciativa que puga sortir de les taules rodones o dels diferents àmbits del Congrés. Mis últimas palabras son de agradecimientos. En primer lugar, a los que nos han patrocinado en esta edición de DITRAD, la editorial John Benjamins, la revista Languages i Strad. Agradecer també a los que m'acompanyen en aquesta mesa, el decano de la Facultat de Traducció i d'Interpretació, el director del Departament de Traducció, Interpretació i Estudis d'Àsia Oriental i el vicerrector de Recerca i Transferència de la Universitat Autònoma de Barcelona, per avalar amb su presència aquest evento. Unas gracias muy especiales a mis compañeros en la dirección de este congreso, Anabel Galán, Cristian Olaya, Patricia Rodríguez y López Romero, y a todo el comité de organización. Esto es obra de un equipo. Gracias también a todos los miembros del comité científico que tuvieron que evaluar todas las propuestas que recibimos, y este año tuvimos más que nunca. También a todos los que habéis aceptado ser moderadores de sesiones, 28 en total, y a los que habéis organizado y moderáis las tres mesas redondas. También a los que habéis aceptado estar en la sala contigua, la sala 5, porque en esta sala no, no hay espacio para todo el mundo. Y, como no, a los intérpretes, que eh, os hacen llegar en este acto nuestras palabras en español y en inglés, gracias a nuestras colegas Marta Romí y Jackie Minet, respectivamente. Y, como no, gracias a los intérpretes de lengua de signos. A nuestro conferenciante, Defen Lee, 
que ha venido de muy lejos, <risa> esperamos que se sienta muy cerca entre nosotros. Y unas gracias muy, muy especiales a todos vosotros por acudir a esta cita y por investigar en didáctica de la traducción y de la interpretación. Y para finalizar, una queja, la de siempre, la que desgraciadamente hago en todas las inauguraciones de DITRAD. La falta de consideración de la investigación didáctica que se da, al menos por estos lares, desde las instituciones y en el seno de la comunidad científica. Sin embargo, la investigación didáctica, no me cansaré de repetirlo, supone la mejor aplicación y la mejor transferencia a la sociedad de la investigación traductológica, ya que garantiza que los futuros traductores e intérpretes podrán ejercer la profesión atendiendo a las demandas e innovaciones sociales y alcanzando niveles de excelencia. Desde sus inicios en los años 70, la investigación en didáctica de la traducción ha evolucionado mucho. Ya no solo elaboramos propuestas didácticas, sino que buscamos su validación mediante pruebas empíricas. Pienso que vamos por muy buen camino. Si DITRAD puede servir para embazar en la investigación didáctica en nuestra disciplina y para que se reconozca cada vez más su importancia, el Grupo Pacte estará muy satisfecho porque DITRAD habrá cumplido su cometido. Muchas gracias por vuestra atención. Bienvenidos a DITRA 2018. Y como dice una canción de un cantautor catalán, y con el permiso de las autoridades que me acompañan en la mesa, casa meva es casa vostra, si es que ya cases de algo. Mi casa es vuestra casa, si es que ya cases de al... casas de alguien. Bienvenidos. Muchas gracias. Pasaremos a un alto de palabras al doctor Joaquín Baltrán, director del Departamento de Traducción e Interpretación y también de Estudios de Asia Oriental y participante, obviamente, también directamente en aquest congrés. Gracias, vicerrector. Bueno, yo hablaré en, en español, en castellano. Estamos en un medio multilingüe, plurilingüe, la diversidad es lo, es lo, es lo que nos caracteriza. Eh, en primer lugar, eh, buenas tardes ¿no? a todos los participantes y asistentes a este cuarto congreso internacional de investigación de didáctica de la traducción, organizado por el Grupo Pacte, que está adscrito a nuestro Departamento de Traducción, Interpretación y de Estudios de Asia Oriental de, de la Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. El, el grupo de investigación Pacte, dirigido por la profesora, doctora y catedrática Amparo Hurtado, eh, ha sido pionero en la investigación en nuestro departamento y entre sus muchos logros y éxitos, sin duda, destaca la organización de este congreso. Es un congreso de carácter internacional y periodicidad bianual. El primero se realizó eh, en el año 2012, ¿eh? cada dos años continúa realizando. Eh, sin duda, este congreso que, que ahora eh, inauguramos eh, ha estado a la vanguardia del importante ámbito que desarrolla, que es la didáctica de la traducción e interpretación. Y sin duda ha contribuido a poner en el mapa del mundo y a difundir a escala global al Grupo Pacte, al Departamento de Traducción e Interpretación de Estudios de Asia Oriental, a la Facultad de Traducción e Interpretación y a la Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, cuya vocación de esta universidad especialmente es la internacionalización. Eh, aprovecho para comentaros que, aunque no soy traductor, mea culpa, no soy traductor, he traducido cinco libros del inglés al español, totalizando aproximadamente 1.600 páginas. Eh, todos ellos, eh, todos los libros que, que he traducido, han estado relacionados con mi especialización en estudios chinos. Traducir para mí no, no fue una vocación, fue una salvación. Traducir me salvó la vida en momentos de precariedad laboral. Es un problema que tenemos especialmente en nuestra universidad. Yo siempre he sido un, un lector voraz y respeto y admiro mucho las buenas traducciones. Cuando traducía, 
echaba de menos el haber tenido una formación mínima sobre traducción que me hubiera ayudado a resolver muchos problemas y despejar muchas dudas. Por eso considero que este congreso que nos reúne aquí hoy es tan importante, porque es necesario profundizar en la enseñanza de la traducción e interpretación. El traductor no nace, sino que se hace. Traducir e interpretar se aprende y para ello hay que enseñarlo. Y a eso os dedicáis todos los investigadores venidos de todo el mundo a este congreso que comienza en nuestra universidad, facultad y departamento. Los congresos son importantes para difundir e intercambiar conocimientos, para ponerse al día del estado de la cuestión de la investigación en el ámbito al que se dedican. Seguro que todas y todos aprenderemos mucho en este encuentro con nuestros compañeros investigadores, a quienes os doy la bienvenida y os deseo buenos debates y un gran éxito, así como que disfrutéis de nuestro campus y de vuestra estancia en Barcelona. Muchas gracias, doctor Beltrán. Eh, muchas gracias y pasaremos la palabra al doctor Albert Blanchadey, que es el degà de la Facultad de Traducción e Interpretación, que es quien se hospeda en este en aquest congreso. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes a tothom, señor vicerrector, señor director del departamento, doctora Hurtado y señoras organizadoras del congreso, benvolguts y benvolgudes congresistas. Las organizadoras me han demanat que les adresi unas palabras de salutación, como ha dado esta facultad. De fet, la doctora Hurtado els ha convidat a sentirse como a casa. Efectivamente, això es casa seva. Siempre que recordin que qui mana en esta casa es el degà, que soy yo mateix. No sé si los intérpretes de signos han casado la broma. Espero que sí. Como saben, la universidad tiene como misiones principales la docencia y la recerca, ahora también el junior partner de la transferencia, y las facultades, en aquest montaje, el que hacemos es organizar la docencia. Fem cosas tan apasionantes como programar las asignaturas, diseñar los horarios, tener cura de aulas como esta, eso es un aula. Pero, tot i que no tenemos competencias en recerca, los degans sí que estem capacitados para sentir esta emoción íntima que se sent cuando se ve como una aula, como esta, se convierte en un espai para un congrés, un espai en que hay debate, confrontación de ideas y finalmente creación de conocimiento. Por tanto, me agrada ser hoy aquí compartiendo con ustedes el momento inicial de este congrés. También cal dir que la ocasión es especialmente significativa por un motivo que no surt en el texto de los intérpretes, pero que el tienen aquí en aquest roll-up. La facultad, en Guany, celebra el 25 aniversario de la seva creación. Por lo tanto, me agrada decirlo, hago un poco de propaganda de esta facultad, así como el director hace propaganda del departamento, entonces todos hacen propaganda. Y, evidentemente, todos somos autónomos y, por tanto, Uh, que lo recordaron. Y la ocasión también es especial porque, como ha dicho la doctora Hurtado, aquí es el Ditrat más grande de la historia. Y de hecho, los Ditrat siempre son grandes. Y son grandes en los dos sentidos de la gran. No sé en inglés si eso funciona, pero en catalán y castellà gran vol dir voluminós. Y efectivamente, veíamos una sala plena y por que me em digan, puede ser que haya gente en la otra sala. Pero gran también significa excels, de alta qualitat. Y no tengo cap duda que el grupo que impulsa el ditrat, el ditrat en sí mateix y espero que también los congresistas, hacen justicia a qué significado de la palabra gran. Sí? Don Re, dite yo, y sin desviarme especialmente del texto que había impactado a las nuevas estimadas intérpretes, los convido, como han hecho antes, a sentirse como a casa. 
sempre respectant el mobiliari i l'autoritat del degà, i els desitjo un congrés molt profitós. L'experiència diu que ho serà, perquè els altres ho han estat, i amb aquesta massa crítica que tenim aquí, el resultat no pot ser altre que un congrés molt profitós. Gràcies i bon congrés. Molt bé, em toca a mi donar unes paraules i que em perdonin els de traducció perquè m'havien demanat el text i jo soc un anàrquic i mai escric les coses i sempre parlo per el que sento en els moments que tinc que parlar. Intentaré parlar a poc a poc, després saludaré en anglès i en castellà o en francès si convé, i en italià. Escolteu, per aquesta universitat aquest congrés és molt important per diversos motius. El primer perquè fa dos anys, a l'edició anterior, feia pocs dies que el nostre equip de govern havia entrat a governar aquesta universitat i de fet va ser un dels primers actes que em va tocar des del punt de vista de congrés científic d'estar participant i en la seva obertura. La qual cosa, doncs, avui em fa recordar que ja fa dos anys que estem demandat i que per mi va ser una satisfacció molt important veure que en un àmbit, diguem-ne, abans s'ha mencionat, que a vegades sembla que no estigui, que estigui com oblidat de l'àmbit de la recerca, de constatar que una facultat com aquesta i un departament com aquest són referents internacionals en els àmbits del seu àrea, del seu àmbit de coneixement. S'ha dit abans que un congrés científic internacional en l'àmbit de la didàctica de la traducció, capaç de reunir tota la gent que és capaç de reunir aquest congrés, és una mostra real que això és un congrés referent dintre de l'àmbit. Deixeu-me dir, i ho vaig comentar fa dos anys, i el temps m'està donant la raó, que el tema de la traducció i, per tant, també la didàctica de la traducció, però en particular el ser capaços d'entendre'ns de forma cada vegada més automàtica i moltes vegades amb artilugis que fa uns anys no sabíem ni que podríem utilitzar, és una cosa molt quotidiana actualment. Jo recordo les dificultats fa uns anys quan un comprava un aparell de fabricació asiàtica i llegia el manual d'instruccions en el que era palès les dificultats de les persones que havien estat traduint aquell manual, perquè normalment eren absolutament intel·ligibles. Et compraves un vídeo i era impossible entendre per què servien les coses o com es tenien que fer funcionar. Això, afortunadament, ha millorat moltíssim. Hi ha una part molt important d'aquest congrés que és tot l'apartat, tots són importants, però l'apartat de l'ensenyament també de les tecnologies que avui estan vinculades en l'àmbit de la traducció i la interpretació és quelcom molt dinàmic i cada vegada, diguem-ne, no dic més complexa, però efectivament que arriba molt més a la societat. Avui en dia ja no és el Google Translator que tothom més o menys ha fet servir alguna vegada de la seva vida per entendre un text en xinès o en idiomes asiàtics o orientals que no entén, sinó també dispositius que et permeten pràcticament escriure una cosa i verbalitzar-la amb l'idioma que tu vulguis. Aquest tipus de tecnologies emergents, cada vegada més sofisticades, fan que el vostre àmbit de recerca sigui un àmbit que ha de barrejar forçosament la lingüística, però també l'enxenyeria, la informàtica i, per tant, àmbits cada cop més multidisciplinars. I deixeu-me dir que en aquest context els àmbits de recerca, no solament com ensenyo a traduir o com ensenyo les llengües o com ensenyo aspectes professionals de la traducció, sinó també aquests aspectes tecnològics que estan molt vinculats directament a tots els altres, fan que a l'àmbit concret de recerca de la traducció i la interpretació sigui un àmbit molt viu, molt dinàmic, amb aportacions cada vegada més novedoses i que, per tant, fa absolutament necessari que hi hagi congressos com aquests. Dit això, deixeu-me dir també, en nom de la meva rectora i de l'equip rectoral, 
que benvinguts a aquells que no sou de l'autònoma en aquest campus. Alguns de vosaltres segur que ja heu estat altres vegades, però molts de vosaltres segurament és la primera vegada. Deixeu-me dir que aquest campus té, com s'ha dit abans, vocació de ser un campus internacional, demostrat no solament pels estudiants de grau, sinó també de màster, de doctorat. Hem fet una clara aposta per la internacionalització a tots els nivells i, per tant, creiem que organitzar congressos com aquest, que permetin a gent de diferents països conèixer el nostre campus, vincular-se amb la nostra realitat, és una manera de fomentar col·laboracions, de fomentar vincles, de fomentar coneixements entre persones, que és el més important, i per tant, d'aquest networking que podem estar fent, segur que se'n derivaran futures col·laboracions, futures relacions, intercanvis d'estudiants, de doctors, etc. Per tant, deixeu-me dir que com a política de recerca d'aquesta universitat, gràcies als organitzadors, gràcies a la facultat per poder acollir un acte d'aquestes característiques, agrair al comitè científic. I would like to say thanks, many thanks to Dr. De Fengli to be here with us. I don't know if this is the first time that you are in this campus. Warm welcome in the name of our rector and our team. I will be sure that uh, your stay here uh, will be very valuable for all of us. And uh, again, many thanks uh, to be here for all of us. And uh, let me say also that for us, is we are very proud of this meeting, of this Congress. Uh, we see that every edition of this meeting is growing in terms of number of people uh, that comes to this event and I will be sure that in the following editions that will also continue in, the, in, in growing uh, tension and so on. Uh, dejadme decir, para, para terminar, uh, a todos aquellos que venéis de países de habla hispana, eh, gracias por estar aquí, bienvenidos al campus de esta universidad, para aquellos que sea la primera vez, y os deseo a todos que estos tres días, estos tres días sean de mucho trabajo y, de, y, de, y fructíferos, seguro que lo van a ser, y para cualquier evento o problema que podáis tener durante estos días, seguro que, además de contar con el comité organizador, que estoy seguro que atenderá cualquier necesidad, sepáis que desde la facultad, el departamento y el equipo de gobierno podéis contar con nosotros. Gracias por estar aquí. Eh, habéis coincidido además con que parece que las lluvias ya han terminado aquí en Barcelona estas semanas y por lo tanto, digamos, vamos a tener buen tiempo. Enjoy Barcelona. Welcome to here. Gracias. Um, hello, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to present Dr. Um, Professor Defeng Lee from the University of Macau. He is director of the Center for Study of Translation, Interpreting, and Cognition. He has taught his work in, uh, in the University of London for several years and in various uh, universities in China. And he has published extensively in, uh, in the fields of uh, second language education and translation studies. And, um, well, just let me pass uh, the floor to one of the most prominent translation scholars in Asia. Um, he'll be speaking for uh, about 45 minutes, 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll have uh, some uh, few minutes for a uh, discussion. And uh, you'll be able to, to make uh, questions uh, at the end, right? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Thank you very much for um, attending my talk this afternoon. Um, it's a great, great pleasure and great honor to be here to share some of my thoughts on translation education with you. And I, it's really such a privilege um, to have a, such a uh, big audience. And I want to take the opportunity to thank Professor Ampardo to, for the very kind invitation and for uh, making this possible 
um, for me to come here uh, for the first time and uh, to speak at this such a um, high profile, um, probably one of the best known uh, conferences on translation didactics. So thank you very much. And I also want to thank Professor, Professor Patricia for um, doing all these logistics to make it possible for me to fly here. Uh, it's a lot of work, it's sent me so many emails, I know that's, that meant a lot of work on her side. And so for my talk, the, as you can see, the title is Teaching of Translation Technology, Curriculum Methods, and Trans uh, Teacher Education. Um, I wanted to sort of cover all these three aspects, but as I was preparing for the talk, I realized I don't have enough time. So I will probably focus on uh, the last part uh, a bit more, that is teacher education, which is of uh, uh, interest, particular interest to me at this point. So what I will do in the next 40 minutes is um, I will sort of, first of all, um, speak briefly on the advances in translation technology and the changes that have brought on to uh, uh, translation profession and translation education. And then I will share with you some of the findings that we have recently conducted a survey on teacher education or translation technology teacher education in China. And I hope some of the implications will be of use to you um, as well. Um, in my talk, I'll probably use this term quite often, translation education. I use it more as an umbrella term to refer to both uh, computer-aided translation and full, fully automatic machine translation as well, and even some other technologies that can help translators translate better uh, with uh, efficiency. Um, I come from a place where, you know, translation technology has been a huge thing in the last five years, and, you know, terms such as artificial intelligence, machine translation, big data, um, cloud computing are in the media almost on a daily basis. And I think probably it's, 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 it's uh, very much like uh, that in many places of the world as well. I think uh, this phase is probably no stranger to many of us here. Um, this is uh, Sophia, right? The first um, robot citizen ever. And who claimed that she will destroy humans, right? But whether that will be true or not is still, you know, anyone's guess. But I think the one thing is certain, that is the advances in AI and also translation technology have brought about changes in the profession and the marketplace. And these changes will continue um, in the years to come. Um, According to one of the uh, most active researchers on translation technology in China, Professor Wei, um, he sort of predicts the changes that are happening in the profession, in the translation profession, is like this. This is what we have at this point, you know, uh, at this moment, where you know most of the translation work is still being done for professional translators. Um, but we also rely on machine to do some of the work for us, okay? But with the um, advances in, in, in translation technology, um, we might think that, you know, some of the work or much of the work will be done by machine-aided translation. That is, you know, we will have to rely on machine to do some of the work for us, but then much of the work will also be done with the aid of uh, computers. Right. But he says this is not actually the case. What he will happen is like this. In the future, much of the work will be done by machine, so machine translation will play a bigger, much bigger role. And then above it, will, there will be a small chunk of work for you know, humans um, to complete with the aid of machine. But then there will be another sort of a, 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 a part of work that's to be done by humans as taggers. What does that, what do taggers do? This is actually already happening at least in China. That is, 
the students or graduates have been hired to tag all kinds of texts so that these texts can be used to train the machines to translate for us. So in the future, there will be really a big need for um, text taggers. But again, whether that's you know, his prediction, and it is already happening in China. But again, like whether that will be become a reality is still yet to see. But um, the thing is, these changes is, has certainly had effect on transition curriculum, right? And what is curriculum? There are many definitions. There's not one agreed definition of curriculum. Um, people may also talk about different kinds of curriculum, such as explicit curriculum, implicit curriculum, hidden curriculum, or excluded curriculum, or even extracurricular, uh, extra curriculum, right? I like Pat, uh, Pratt's definition. He says the curriculum is a written document that systematically describes goals, planned objectives, content, learning activities, evaluation procedures, and so forth. And Smith believes that in order to design a curriculum, this is the procedure we'll have to go through. We ident identify the needs of the students and then formulate objectives, select content, and organize the content to be delivered, and then select the learning experiences we would like our students to have, and also organize their learning experiences. And finally, determine what to evaluate and the best ways to evaluate. Um, and we know that to whether you're going to design a curriculum or you're going to um, implement any curricular innovation, teachers are at the center. Teachers are at the core because they are the planners, they are the organizers, and they are the evaluators. So in, when we consider career changes to be made in response to the advances in translation technology, teacher knowledge and teacher education have to be taken into account. So just like that, the ultimate goal of translation training is to develop students' translation competence. The one thing to consider in, in teacher education and teacher development is how to ensure they provide effective teaching but then how to develop and enhance teachers' professional competence so that they can provide effective teaching. According to a lawman and Connick, 2016, they believe teachers' professional competence consists of mm. their professional knowledge, their skills, beliefs, and motivation. And teachers' professional competence is a critical predictor of teachers' professional well-being and success. And we know in this um, model of teachers' professional competence, teachers' knowledge figures most prominently. Um, in the literature on translation, oh, oh, sorry, the literature on teacher knowledge, there are many models have been proposed. As you can see, there are a number of researchers who have written on different models of teacher knowledge or their knowledge structure. The one that has been most influential is the model proposed by Lee Shulman of Harvard University. He believes that a teacher needs to have these knowledge in order to do a good job, in order to provide effective teaching. Their knowledge consists of content knowledge, general pedagogical knowledge, curriculum knowledge, pedagogical content knowledge, knowledge of the learners and their characteristics, knowledge of educational contexts, and also knowledge of the educational ends, purposes, and values. What is particular about this model is his idea of pedagogical content knowledge. So what is pedagogical context? The other knowledge are all familiar to us. You need to know the content in order to do a good job. You need to teach. 
You need to have the skills of classroom management in order to you know, provide effective teaching. Well, what is pedagogical content knowledge? So according to Lee Schulman, that's the knowledge that's unique to teachers or to teachers of a particular discipline. That is the knowledge you can combine the pedagogy with the content. So we say that's a special amalgam of content and pedagogy, and it's knowledge that um, tells how subject matter are organized, adapted, and represented for instruction. And another model proposed on second language teacher education by Richard Day is very useful for us because it's much simpler and it's based on you know, um, the model proposed by Lee Shulman. According to Richard Day, there will be four major kinds of knowledge that teachers need to have. Content knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, pedagogical content knowledge, and then support knowledge. So support knowledge refers to the knowledge of the various disciplines that inform our approach to the teaching and learning of English. And for us, it will be teaching and learning of translation. So if we map, map that model onto the teaching of translation, this is what we'll see. For content knowledge, it will be the knowledge of subject matter, that is what translation teachers teach. Right? And then for pedagogical knowledge, it's very much the same, the knowledge of generic teaching strategies, beliefs, and practices, classroom management, motivation, decision making. And for pedagogical content knowledge, that will be the specialized knowledge of how to represent content knowledge about translation in different ways so that students can understand. The knowledge of how students come to understand translation and what difficulties they are likely to encounter when learning translation and what misconceptions might interfere with their learning and how we can overcome these problems. Teaching translation skills, teaching material development, translation assessment evaluation, translation program curriculum evaluation and development, and translation teaching methods. And then for support knowledge will be knowledge about the neighboring disciplines which we can bring to help us with our teaching. And research has shown that when teacher has when the teacher has good content knowledge, their students will have higher achievements. And it's the same with pedagogical content knowledge. So better pedagogical content knowledge of a teacher will lead to higher performances by the students. And then what do translation scholars say about Translation and interpreting teachers' knowledge. Guatek believes that uh, at the, as the start of a translation teacher, the teacher should spend one month in each of the three, three following situations. Basically, you need to have the practical um, experience, right? You are by either working in a translation firm or working in an in house translation service or being a freelance professional. Rosa also agrees with. Uh, Guadec, that translator trainers should be active translators, or at least have ample professional experience in this area. Another research by the name of Garber also believes that teaching is a very difficult task. Imparting knowledge and experience to another person not only requires mastery of the subject matter, but also mastery of the communication of knowledge. Therefore, a translator and interpreter professor has to have knowledge and experience in translation and interpreting and the ability to teach. So the ability to, um, of the knowledge of the profession that is practical translation experience and also the ability to teach. And Dorothy Kelly speaks on a teacher's knowledge as well. She believes that the teaching of translation should be research-based and research-informed. So translator training is now mostly offered at secondary school, no, sorry, post-secondary level, that is at the university. 
Therefore, all the transition teachers are expected to provide research, right, in order to survive, but also in order to use their research to support their teaching. So they need to have the knowledge of research as well. So if we put this together, this is the sort of the kind of structure of teacher's knowledge I can see. You know, so transition teacher knowledge consists of three parts, knowledge of, of teaching, knowledge of research, knowledge of the trade. And then that, under knowledge of teaching, we have content knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, pedagogical content knowledge, and support knowledge. So after Lee Schumann of Harvard University, an Another um, group of researchers who have uh, published, an, an, uh, published another important um, uh, work on teachers' knowledge is Mishra and Kohler. They argue that effective teaching requires an understanding of how technology refer relates to pedagogy and content. And they come up with a term which is called technological pedagogical content knowledge, which emphasizes the connections, the interactions, affordances, and constraints between and among content, pedagogy, and technology. Basically, because of the advances in technology, right, teachers need to have knowledge of the modern technology and how the technology can help them best with their delivery of their teaching. So um, this is a new sort of a new concept, technological pedagogical content knowledge. Basically, you need to combine content with pedagogy with technology, right? And I think this concept is of particular relevance to us, at least at two levels. First of all, of course, we need to make use of technology to help us simply with teaching of translation. Right, and on my on my way here, I know my colleagues here at this university show me the equipment they have here to help deliver, you know, uh, interpreting to the students. So we need to use technology, and it's useful to us, also relevant to us, also at another level that is, you know, translation technology itself. That is something we need to teach to our students today, right? So technology as an essential skill for translators and interpreters today needs to be taught to our students. So because of these, I believe that translation teachers need to have a good TPCK knowledge, that is, technological pedagogic content knowledge. So in that sense, I can revise the structure of uh, translation <coughs> teachers' knowledge. Right? Therefore, that is, we have an additional part under knowledge of teaching, that is technological, pedagogic, content knowledge. <coughs> but of course then we'll, we may ask, if the teacher have good knowledge of all this, does that mean this knowledge will translate um, directly into good teaching performance in the classroom? Right? And well, I don't have the answer, but I think that's a question that um, worthy asking, or worth asking. And of course, that's not my, uh, the focus of my talk today. My talk is more on translation technology, um, you know, why it is necessary that we need to teach this to our students, and how the teaching of translation technology has been going on in the classroom or in the translation training programs. So now I will sort of report a survey that we have um, uh, conducted on the aim of the Masters of Translation Interpreting Programs in China. Um, and I think, um, you know, we, because it's more like a status survey, so we basically touched on all the important curricular aspects of uh, translation training. Um, but we have a focus on translation teacher provision and also teacher development. Because as I mentioned earlier, teachers are at the center of curricular design and curricular in innovation. Um, it's a questionnaire survey combined with semi-structured um, interviews with some of the teachers. 
And the questionnaire survey consists of 33 questions. It was um, um, administered via WeChat, which is like a Twitter, Chinese, you know, a Chinese Twitter. And it's been working very well for us. We actually deliver, uh, because now in China, we have all together 249 uh, master's program in translation and interpreting. And the questionnaires were sent to all these programs. We got 224 questionnaires back. So what did we find? We asked the question whether uh, translation technology is offered in the programs. So we can see about 56% um, said the translation technology is being <coughs> offered. But also there are about 45% of the programs which are not offering translation technology to their students. So it's a big number, 45%. And then we asked why a translation technology was not offered. These are given as the reasons. First of all, no qualified translation technology teachers available. Second, no supporting hardware or software, basically a funding issue. And then no degree credits are available for the course in the program. And then faculty management does not see the need for translate technology. And then we wanted to find out who are actually teaching these courses. So we want to know their professional competence and the type of knowledge um, as a teacher of translation technology. We asked the, about the number of years of teaching translation technology. As you can see, this number of years. Um, most of them have been teaching for one year to two years or to three years. Right? So you can see this is a more recent development in China. And then professional experience of translation technology. Right? Do the teachers have any practical experience in using any translation technology in their practical translation work. This is very interesting <coughs> because the, the, the number of teachers tend to fall on both ends of a con continuum. About 36% of the teachers said they did not have any experience of practical translation um, using uh, trans any form of translation technology. And then we have about 30 percent of the teachers said they have 12 years or more experience of using translation technology. So what does that mean? It means that many of the teachers are actually from the industry. They are part-time teachers hired to teach the course for the programs. Right? So they have been in the profession for, for a long time. That's why they have long years of experience of using translation technology. And then we ask them whether they are familiar with the um, technology. So here, most of them say they have average knowledge of translation technology. And about 15% say they are not familiar with translation technology. And 7% say they are very unfamiliar with translation technology. So if we would combine these two categories together, there are about um, twenty three percent right of the teachers said they are not familiar with the technology at all. So you come to think of it, this is not um, a encouraging uh, number, right because in order to do a good job to provide effective teaching as we just sort of reviewed they need to have very good subject matter knowledge, right? Many of them said they are not familiar with the technology. They are not, uh, or they have just have average knowledge of translation technology. So if they do not have perf um, enough experience, if they do not have uh, good content knowledge, 
have they ever tried to attend any training programs? So this is the number. 64% of the teachers said they have attended um, training programs, but again, also about one third of the teachers said they didn't have a chance to attend any training programs. And then we tried to ask, find out what kind of training programs have they attended. Right. These, um, if you can see, we have uh, translation technology training run by the Translators Association of China in the summer or fall every year, because the association runs a training program almost every summer or every fall. And then translation training, a uh, translate technology training run by language service providers, by the industry. And then we have other sort of training run by other smaller associations or um, or a committee, national committee of masters of translation and interpreting. So you can see the numbers and also the percentages. But we do see there's a combination of government agencies and also private uh, or, or industries which are you know, providing all these training programs for teachers. I also want to know how effective have these training been for them? Or this is uh, how, how long um, are these programs in general, right? It seems that these pr training programs run from you know, three days to one week to you know, two weeks, right, two weeks. And it's about the effectiveness of the training programs. Um, generally, they think they are very happy with these training programs. So in that sense, the training programs have been useful for them. Because almost half of the people um, said they are, very, they are satisfactory with the training received at the training programs. And then about 10% of the participants said they are very happy with the uh, effectiveness of the training programs. Um, only about like, Six or seven percent of the teachers said they are not very satisfactory. Right? These training are not very, very satisfactory. But what did they get more specifically? What did they learn in these programs? Gaining a proper understanding of translation technology, 59 percent. And then gaining a systematic understanding of translation technology, 45 percent. Familiar with and skilled in the use of major translation technology software, 52%. Obtaining some translation technology teaching resources, 40%. Right. And then significantly improving my translation technology operation abilities, hands-on experience, 31%. Right. So basically they are happy that because they you know, understand technology better, they got teaching resources that can help them, and they become more skilled in using these um, technology. What problems did they see they had in these uh, training programs? First of all, insufficient hands-on experience. Too few translation technology cases for analysis. And then training workshops lasting too long. And then too few translation technology professionals as instructors. Or too little tutorship by translation technology instructors. Right. Now, this is sort of what we found. But what do they mean for us? I think, first of all, first thing that we can sort of get out of this survey is that we believe that curricular changes to be made to account for translation technology advances begins with a proper understanding of translation technology. If you still remember about half of the, half of the surveyed translation uh, training programs have not offered translation technology to their students. Uh, the reasons they gave for not offering this to their students is that they, you know, 
either the faculty management um, not seeing the importance or the need for translation technology for their students, or there's no cred extra credits for the course. But I think all this boils down to really um, the fact whether they see translation technology as an important component for their students. Because if they see it as important, they'll be able to find um, you know, fund, they'll be able to find uh, credit, they'll be able to really fit this module or fit this course into the curriculum. So we need to understand you know, translation technology better right, in order to offer this course to our students. So the idea is really not to ignore or dismiss it because translation technology is not um, a menace, but rather it's a driving force for changes in translation practice and training. And I think this quote from um, prod owner at MemoQ says very well for us. He says machine translation works standing a well in repetitive machine-like translation projects where little cultural context and understanding is needed. Machines will take over translation jobs only in certain areas. Nonetheless, for it to rival the capabilities of a human brain, two things are needed, a full understanding of the human brain and the computing power to replicate it. Neuroscientists will tell you that mankind is far from the first, whereas the second is in its early stages in the form of quantum computing. So I think that all students should be given the opportunity to embrace translation technology. Translation technology should be provided in translation training programs to enhance their employability. Curricular changes are urgently needed to account for the advances in translation technology and translation technology dependent practices. Secondly, I believe different training courses or camps are needed for transition technology teachers. As we remember that the most important reasons for the half of the surveyed programs not offering transition technology to their students was the shortage of qualified transition technology teachers. And we also see that overall the training provided in the form of crash courses seem to have worked well for the teachers. So therefore, when designing such courses, I think translation teachers' knowledge structure may serve as pointers. If we still remember this sort of a structure of a knowledge structure of translation and interpreting teachers. Right. Um, according to the sort of survey that we can see in this um, curricular innovation, knowledge of profession and uh, knowledge of content should probably be emphasized. Because one third of the translation technology teachers reported that they're having no professional experience of translation technology at all. So that's knowledge of the trade. And 23% of the translation technology teachers said they are unfamiliar or very unfamiliar with translation technology. Again, content knowledge. 46% of the translation technology teachers have an average understanding of transition technology. As I said, this is not an encouraging number at all because we are supposed to be experts you know, to teach you know, the content to our students. And then we also need to uh, think about PCK or TPCK, although you didn't really come up in the survey, but we can, we can tell because you know, um, when we asked about the number of years they have worked with translation technology, the number of teachers fell on both ends of the continuum. Some said they had no experience at all. Um, others said they had more than 12 years of experience. And then those who are coming from industry um, may have very good knowledge of content or, or knowledge of the trade, I mean, but they probably are weak in um, the pedagogy, right? So that means that we need to really think about the 
PCK or even TPCK for them. So teachers are likely to have different needs, right? Therefore, no one training program fits all. Instead, we need to design different teacher training programs to meet different needs. And in this, you know, this, uh, curriculum design, TPCK of teacher's knowledge structure and Kali's framework of transition trainer's competence can be useful. And then more specifically, what kind of transition technology training should be provided? Um, according to the survey, because the teachers are generally happy with the transition technology training they have received, right? Um, what have made them happy are these, proper understanding of transition technology, systematic understanding of transition technology, skilled use of software, and acquisition of transition technology teacher resources, and teaching methods. And they are also asked to um, sort of report on what they see as the problems of these training programs. They express the need more hands-on experience and more um, transition technology cases for analysis and perhaps longer training courses. So this is what we saw earlier, right? So earlier. Okay, so if I sort of uh, briefly sum up and conclude, I would like to say the advances of the, um, AI and also big data will serve as the driving force for further development of transition technology particularly machine translation. And such progress in transition technology will continue to change the structure of the transition profession, which is going to be very different from today. Such changes will continue to have serious implications for transition curricular designs, including goals and objectives of training, contents to be taught, methods to be used, and the ways to test the learning effectiveness. And at the center of the curricular changes, transition technology teachers figures most prominently. So training and retraining of transition technology teachers is at the core. Through transition technology teacher training and teacher development, we can ensure that the teachers and students can stay ahead of transition technology. This is very important for all of us. If we do not end up like what the New Yorker depicted, that is, you know, end up in a world where, which is ruled by robots and we are left on the roadside, you know, at the mercy of robots, or in our case, transition technology. It's very important that we act now and we stay ahead of transition technology, both for teachers and students. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, for this very interesting and insightful talk, uh, Professor Lee. Now we have uh, around 10 minutes um, for a discussion, for questions. Uh, if uh, anybody wants to open the floor. Yes, Omar, is there? My name is Omar, I'm sorry. Excuse me, there. there's a microphone uh, being passed around and, for, uh, and to help interpreters as well. Thank you very much, Professor. It's on. Talking about technology. Again, thank you, Professor. Really, an immense task that you present to all of us in the, in the industry. And um, I am just trying to relate to the whole structure which you presented in a very neat, professional manner to each one of us, I think. 
The point is to me, oh, now we're getting the technology, <laughs> is how can we, don't you think we have first to um, measure teachers' knowledge structures as they are, as a priority or as a prior step to engaging us in the acquisition and development of translation technology? That's my question, because when I look at, you know, I think I will just stop here to give the chance, the floor for everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question or, or the comment. I, I think the answer is yes. It's yes. What I present is more from a, a, a literature perspective or from a theoretical perspective, what, you know, teachers' knowledge um, structure should be like, but I think it will be very useful to really to go to the teachers to um, probably even take a more ethnographical uh, approach to find out what you know, knowledge they have now, as you just pointed out. I think that would be very interesting and very useful. Yeah. So we can probably approach this issue from um, sort of both directions. I presented more from the literature and from the literature on teacher education because I have I have a background in, in education. I did my uh, PhD in education. So I think that's um, sort of help us to, 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 uh, um, to, look, to decide what to look for if we are going to take an, a more sort of ethnographic approach to, um, to, to find out what teachers already have there. Right. Yeah, just let me remind you, the, the atten uh, attendees and the other um, room, that they can make questions as well, yeah? Um, thank you very much um, for a very interesting talk. I felt, got the feeling at the end with this picture that really where you're aiming for is not exactly what your hidden agenda, you have a big hidden ag agenda there, no? In oh, your my hidden agenda, okay. <laughs> um, as you said, it's obviously true that it's very important that we all have a proper assessment of, 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 of technology. Uh, and I am, as an ancient practitioner of teaching translation, I must admit that I am very, very backward in this proper assessment. But <laughs> um, as you said in, in your talk, it's very important uh, we, the, the teacher knows how students come to understand translation, no? And in my sort of experience over the years, it's that moment was the click, so there's like a click, no? And suddenly, with some students, it starts in the at the end of the first year or the beginning of the first year, some, they're not in, until they get to a master's program, do they really realize that translation is communication, no? And that really takes a long time for some people to learn, no? Um, and it's, uh, it seems to me that what is very interesting that a lot of the, the MA programs in translation in China are very new, mm -hmm. relatively, no? Yes. Because I had a, a student called Huang Wei who did a thesis which was terminated, finished in 2014 on a, a communicative proposal for teaching uh, pedagogical translation uh, uh, in China. And so she did a survey of the state of the masters then. There were a few um, Spanish English, no? N nothing with any other languages. And she studied the, the material being used and it was still, it wasn't communicative, it wasn't technological, it was really um, contrastive linguistics or word-for-word -word translation that was still being taught like six, seven, eight years ago, no? So now you've got all these master's programs. They're all going to start teaching technology, and I see we're all going to end up there. <laughs> um, I... Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, very interesting comment, and I, actually I thought about that too, because I know on my way here uh, this afternoon on the train, um, I and my colleague are, was, were talking with a, 
a doctoral student from this uh, university. We were talking about translation technology, and she said she was worried. She was also sort of worried about um, um, her job prospect as a trans future translator, because she said one of her closest friends said to her, you should start to reconsider your career plan, because you will be replaced by machines, right? In, in the years, you will find no job. But I think um, um, this is, I think now overall, at my response to her uh, in, in our conversation is that we are in a huge um, predicament now um, in the profession of translating education. Um, in China, we have, as we can see, there are people who have seen the uh, the advances or the progress that we've made in Chinese English translation? Because say, like 20 years ago, when you know people talked about translation technology, even computer in you know computer aided translation, we simply did not um, you know give give did not give a damn for it. You know we simply turned away. With we made you know, tested some of the translation softwares, and we believe that, that, you know, that's not something which will be a threat to us at all. However, in the last few years, um, translation, both translation and interpreting, um, using technology as aid or even uh, fully automatic translation interpreting softwares have been devised, because there are many companies uh, commercial companies in China who are really working hard um, to design these softwares. Because most recently, about a month ago, there um, one hu big company in China uh, actually um, demonstrated their technology, interpreting technology, in the high-profile Bo uh, Bo Ao uh, forum. It's a high-profile forum on. Um, find on um, trade, uh, commerce, and internationalization. And it was very impressive because um, the software was able to really transcribe all the speeches immediately, instantly, and also provided the translation instantly and in different languages, for example, in Japanese, in English, in German, all at the same time. It was shown on all these huge screen, screens installed around the conference room. So in that sense, we do know that trans technology is there. We can't afford to simply turn away from them, right? Turn away from them. So I think that's probably why some of the programs in China now have started offering this translation technology to their students while many others are still not you know, uh, 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 in there yet. So I think that's the kind of, kind of uh, um, sort of dilemma we have uh, in, in China now. But I think as if, from my point of view, I think we, because the, the technology is there, translation technology is there, it's happening and it's going to change the future of, oh, for translators. Right, we need to at least teach our students about uh, what is translation technology, what te technology are available to us, right, and so that we can stay ahead. And I think quite often what we, we like to say that technology can never replace humans entirely. Um, but then um, the technology, we, c we have seen that technology are replacing or are doing much some of the work that we relied on human hands before, right? So now, when we, sometimes when we talk about translator training, we say, "Oh, for te technology, we should probably work on um, really find out what technology cannot do for us, and then you know teach that to our students." And I think that's probably the the, the right way to go. Uh, probably we, 
We are, I'm, I'm afraid that we're running out of time and, um, well, coffee and sweets are waiting for us outside. Uh, I don't mean that that's any better than listening to, to you. Uh, it's tempting, though, at this time in the, in the evening. But, um, but maybe uh, we, get, we have uh, time for one more question that was already um, asked. And, um, and then maybe we can move on to the, to the Japanese garden outside. And we can, uh, if you have more questions or comments, maybe you can approach uh, Dr. Lee outside. And during these days, uh, uh, he'll, he'll be with us. Yes? So last question, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Hi. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I'm Begonia Rodriguez from the University of Portsmouth. And I agree totally with you that we need to take um, translation technologies into account. Uh, to include them in the curriculum. But fortunately for us trainers who still believe in linguistic, linguistic and translation skills, uh, we are currently um, researching very closely with translation companies in the UK. And uh, preliminary results of the survey that we have conducted with about 16 of them um, have provided us with a very interesting insight. They are telling us do not bother with translation technologies. Just tell them what technology is all about. We prefer to have good linguists that come to us and are trained by us with the tools that we use, with our workflows, and with our own software. So this is a completely, view, completely different view of what we've been hearing in the last few years. And um, you know, it's, uh, going back to the grassroots, going back to what we used to do before technologies were here. So yes, you know, teach them what technologies are all about, but of course don't forget the human factor. Because mm. automation is here to stay, but we need to make them aware of where we come into the yeah. whole translation process. Yeah. So. Well, I agree with you. I think well, we, we probably have different, we're talking about um, different purposes. I think when I said that we need to take translation technology into account and offer that to our students, so I'm thinking that students will be translators. Um, but what you describe is really companies which are looking more for linguists. Translators. translators. Yes. Mm. Well, I, I, would that be sort of uh, translators with, or linguists with, with knowledge of translation? Because um, should, I, I know because my, my wife is a, is a linguist and she worked for a uh, company in Canada and you know they really didn't want um, much sort of a knowledge of translation technology but really want her to be a, 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 a linguist, a, a probably more a contrastive a, a, a expert in contrastive linguistics which can help them really probably develop uh, technologies for translation. Yes, I'm afraid that we have to leave it here. And uh, please uh, give a, a warm, uh, a big round of applause to, to uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.